How's everybody today, tonight? Are you ready for Christmas? Got your, all your packages purchased? Okay. That sounded pathetic. So uh, I like, uh, is my microphone something wrong with it there? There we go. Thank you, Mr. Soundman. I've got it on wrong somehow, probably. Is that better? All right. So I like uh, Christmas, and I love Christmas carols, and I love that song, Oh Holy Night. Oh, what a night it must have been. Can you imagine? So I, I thought I was praying about what I should share, and I kind of have, an, a, a, in, a, in a sense, an apologetic message. It has a wrap-up at the end of the message of, of just how significant Bethlehem is. And so I thought we'd start off and sing, uh, are you going to play for me? Oh my goodness, this is amazing that you're playing this for me. Are you kidding? This is awesome, Steve. Man. Uh, oh, little town, is that it? What key are we in? I don't know how to find my note. I'm not Brett. B flat? Mm hmm, mm hmm, is that a flat? I sound flat. Hmm. Okay. Mm hmm. Oh. Oh, little, is that that high? Oh, little town, is that it right there? Okay, here we go. Y'all sing it with me. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above your deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. O holy child, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Give it up for Mr. Stevie Ellingson. Thank you, Steve. What, huh? I, when you probably, when, when did you find out that I wanted to do this like 10 minutes ago? I don't even think you knew about it. I was surprised. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. The man instant in season and out of season. So I love that hymn. At the, at the end of it, we'll probably just do it a cappella. I'm going to do one last verse, but I put it at the end because of the words of it. But um, I also wanted to... Uh, um, to tell you that tonight, I hope that th not only is apologetics is a defense of the faith, but I also hope that you take something from it that's significant. So how many of you ever been to Bethlehem? Raise your hand. You've been to Bethlehem. How many want to go to Bethlehem? March 2019. Mark it down, start saving your money. We're going. Okay, go with us. You'll love to be with Dr. Nunley. Uh, it's a great song, a little town of Bethlehem, and, uh, and but Bethlehem in the days of Jesus wasn't much to be talked about. I mean, it was a town of less than a thousand inhabitants. It had a, a few, a few uh, houses on the side of the hill. It, it just wasn't, it wasn't a whole lot there. It, wasn't, it was a pretty obscure village. It wouldn't have impressed us. Um, so, people say at the beginning of the first century, uh, and uh, that... Um, the houses might have been kind of scattered along the side of a ridge and, and had a, a, a protected by a wall that was kind of half broken down. It wasn't anything much to look at. But it was a city that God chose as the birthplace of Christ Jesus. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, but why? <clears throat> why did he choose that? He could have chosen Jerusalem or Hebron or a number of other impressive cities, but the Bible says, and our text, Micah 5 2, <clears throat> the Bible says, but you, Bethlehem, if, 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 I know, I practice saying it a zillion times, I'm just nervous, okay? But I say, Ephrata, Ephrata, 
Ephratha. Okay? So I can play it on here. I can pull it up and play it, and it says how to say it. But anyway, it's specifically a, a different Bethlehem because near Nazareth, there was another Bethlehem. It was only just a few miles away. And this was more like 70, 75 miles away. And there's a reason that Micah made a point to, uh, to tell us which Bethlehem it was. Though you are small among the clans of Judah, notice Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from an old, are from old, from ancient times. Notice the prophecy. We don't sing, uh, we just say Bethlehem, right? <laughs> it would kind of be weird to say, uh, O little town of Bethlehem, Ephratah. No, it doesn't say that. We sing, O oh, just, O little town. And so, it's, it's, but it's an important place and there's a significance to it all. So, um, this was to fulfill prophecy, the reason that, that, uh, that, that Micah was given the prophecy specific so that the prophecy, one of the many prophecies of the birth of Jesus Christ would be fulfilled and be filled specific. But what difference would it really make? Why would God even care which Bethlehem Jesus was born in? Why, why does God care? Well, Luke 2.11 gives us this. I hope I have this verse up there. And it gives us part of the answers. The angels declare to the shepherds, it says this, the angels are telling the shepherds. Now, I've seen the shepherd field, okay? And <clears throat> so we talk about whether Christmas is like in December, it very well might have been. The temperatures uh, from 45 to, uh, to uh, 60 degrees during the time of the rainy season in the late fall and then through the winter, it doesn't really get that cold there and usually the snow melts away in a day, and there has been times when it stayed longer than that. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. I've got this drainage going on that is just driving me crazy. And, uh, but anyway, uh, so very well, it, it was a time when, the, when it says the shepherds were out in the fields watching their sheep, it's because it was too far to go back and forth to where the shepherds are typically, typically kept when the fields are barren and there's nothing to eat. So this is the time when the fields are blooming. So it's gonna be somewhere between November and uh, the end of February, first of March. And probably December, January, somewhere in there when Jesus was born. And people people uh, have, have debunked that. But we don't really care exactly when, but it's interesting the specific detail that the shepherds are in the fields watching their flock by night because that only happened at a certain period of the time. And so, um, there would be a lot, of, a lot of the shepherds there that were watching. And you, there, there's particular fields that they still have sheep herders and shepherds there today. And you can see and stand at the top and look down over that area and look at the sky. And the angels come. And it's, it's overwhelming to experience that and to visit that place. But notice what he says in Luke 2, 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You see, Bethlehem was the city of David. That's important. Pro the prophecy throughout Scripture mentions that the Messiah, the Christ, would be from the lineage of David. And this Bethlehem, specific Bethlehem, is the city of David. And a Savior who is Christ the Lord will be born there. And it was Bethlehem that David himself was anointed by the king, by Samuel, as the king of Israel. It was this same Bethlehem that David was anointed king. And therein lies the reason Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Ephrathah. Jesus was the promised Messiah. And many of the Old Testament prophecies, as I said, declared that the Messiah was be, would be of the line of David. Isaiah 9 is another one. Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7, for example, says, For, unto, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and they will call him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign, what does it say? On David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. You see, the lineage of King David is important. The town where David was anointed king. The town of David, the city of David, the Bible refers to it. So the Messiah was to reign on David's throne, and everybody in Israel, they all knew that. So this is what the angels proclaimed. When the angel appeared to Mary to tell her that she would bear uh, Jesus the Christ, the Savior, 
of the world. Your child, he says, will be great. Luke 1 32 says this, your child will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. See, there it is again. The Messiah was to be the son of David sitting upon the throne. In Luke 18, 39, a blind man cries out, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy. There it is again. Jesus was referred to as son of David. He was the lineage of David, born in Bethlehem. And so it, 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 it's, the Bible is very clear. It's very specific and consistent. You don't see these consistencies without knowing that this is a real story. It's not just some little story you tell your kids. This stuff is stuff that goes, this is, this is real and it's true. And it's true. By the way, <clears throat> as a side note, the only church, one of the only churches that stood and wasn't destroyed by, by the Persian army coming from the east uh, uh, was the church of the nativity. And the reason was they came up and they saw uh, artwork of the wise men and they go, that's from our country and they left that church alone and didn't destroy it. And it's not a question in anybody's mind in Israel, nobody, not the Palestinians, not the Israelites, that that's the place of the birth of Jesus. It's a factual fact, you don't need the Bible to know it, you can go there and find it out and it's proven, it's there and it's the place, even though it's filled with trappings beyond measure of religiosity when you go visit, because they build the church over these holy sites. Another site that's, if you go to Israel you'll see, is the site where he was crucified. And there's no doubt it's the place he was crucified and the place where he was laid buried and there is no doubt that that's where he was buried and that's where he rose from. And you can see the type of cave, an example, not the one because there's another one nearby, but nearby where Jesus was laid and buried, there's another cave that's an example of exactly the type of cave or the type of tomb that he was laid in that was sealed up. It's, it's, you, you won't ever doubt it, and if you can save the money and go to Israel, you should do so. When Jesus entered in Jerusalem, here's another time, Palm Sunday, we call it, uh, waving their palm branches. Matthew 21, 9 tells us the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. There it is again. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Bethlehem was the city of David. It was ingrained in the thinking of Israel that Messiah, the promised king, would be of the line and the kingship of David. And, da and God drove that truth home, not only by prophecies that declared that he'd be the line of David throughout the Old Testament, but also by the very choice of the birthplace. And it came to be miraculously as the angels declared that Bethlehem was the city of David. Now that alone should impress us. And you've already have enough to go, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm like convinced this is real. So when you talk to people, knowing apologetics, knowing the defense of the faith, this is a good thing to talk about. 700 years before Jesus was born, Micah prophesied 700 years that he'd be born in Bethlehem. Now I, I thought that's a long time, but then I think about Georgine almost being 100. And Georgine, your life, it feels like it went like that, right? Short time. Think if, if 100 years, when you live almost that long, you look back at your life and it feels like it's that quick, think for God himself that understands eternity better than us, how 700 years seems like a snap to him. Remember the Bible says a day of the Lord is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day rather, you know? So I'm, I'm just saying, while it's 700 years, it's impressive that how could anybody orchestrate such an event to have the Christ born and angels appear and these people show up that Pastor Jeff talked about, the wise men from the east. But wait, there's more. I believe there's another reason that God chose Bethlehem as the birthplace because what the name meant. How many know what Bethlehem means? A long, for a long time, God would change names because the names had meaning, right? He changed Peter's name, right? He, he changed uh, Salem to Jerusalem. Jacob renamed Israel. Simon is made Peter. And Bethlehem, the name Bethlehem and its meaning, I believe, of Christ's birthplace, has a significance to it, and it means house of bread. Well, what did Jesus say in John 6, 35? He says, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. What did the Beatitudes say? He who hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. Let me tell you something. This Jesus that comes 
comes to be the bread of life for us. Now, we, we know that, that uh, uh, you know, America alone eat about people, Americans eat about 34 million loaves of bread per day, and that doesn't include bagels and all kinds of other things that aren't called a loaf of bread. And a loaf of <clears throat> bread is known as the staple of life. It's what most people depended upon just to survive. And that's why Jesus referred to, what was he referring to when he, when he said in Matthew 4, 4, when the devil was tempting him and he's quoted back to Satan, he said, man does not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. See, Jesus is the word. He is the bread of life. And, and, and he, he fulfills things and satisfies things that nothing else does. You need bread to survive, but we need spiritual bread. It's just a different thing. Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 3 is another text that talks about, about this. Isaiah prophesying in the future. And, 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 and we have many New Testament uh, verses that use picture type uh, pictures uh, in the scriptures that fulfill this. Isaiah 55 says, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you, have no, you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. My faithful love promised to David. Isaiah cried out, come to the waters of life. Come and eat the bread that is real bread. Come and eat and drink and be satisfied. That's what he's saying. And when Jesus came, he came to satisfy the hunger and the thirst that Isaiah speaks of. But what is that hunger? What, what is the hunger that Jesus came to satisfy? Why is it that only Jesus can satisfy? And here's where you can grab a hold of something to help you go after Jesus. First, every person in the world needs this one thing, and that's acceptance. Acceptance. Relation, or I could say this, relationships. True friendships. Everybody is longing for it. When I was a young guy and I went to high school, I'd been raised up with these group of friends and went to this junior high, then I went to high school, and I was of, of the people, of, of my family wasn't well known, my family didn't have a lot of money, and I went to high school in the area of town that had a lot of money, and people pushed me away, the athletes, because I was better than all of them, they kind of pushed me away, they didn't invite me to go out, I wasn't included in, in much. Okay, I'm just telling you, it was a lonely thing. I felt alone. I, I wanted acceptance, but I wouldn't compromise at that point just to get acceptance. And it was, it was hurt. And I know what it's like to feel unaccepted. And let me tell you something. It's never okay to make fun of somebody. Be careful. It's never okay to laugh at someone because they're a little different. Don't ever do it. You see, the view of God for most people in the world is that God is this big judge, some sort of killjoy in heaven. But when the baby, is something wrong? It is? You sure it's not just me? <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Can you turn it on? Okay, we're switching mics, I guess. Test one, two. I couldn't tell it up here. It feels like it might be in the monitor or something. I don't know, but anyway. Uh, am, I, am I too loud? Could you understand me? Should I start over? Let's vote. How many want me to start over? Raise your hand. Two. You guys are ornery. <laughs> the rest of them are going, no, please. <laughs> okay, so where was I? I was saying this, that, uh, you know, so people re view God like, you know, just a, just a, a harsh judge, rule maker, and, you know, I don't know, just a wrong view of who God is. But here's Jesus in a manger, and that's different. I mean, have you ever noticed what happens when someone brings a baby to church and everybody crowds around the mother and, and, and they do things they wouldn't do to ordinary people, you know, and they act the ways they would and they make weird noises and all that? It's because babies don't reject you. Listen, body language, eye, face, facial language, all of that, it is wrong always to act like you're better or put people down. Don't ever forget it. And the people that do it are absolutely wrong. 
It's, it's not the heart of God. It's terrible. It's absolutely awful. I hate it. That's why John 3, 16 is, is, uh, is so popular. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Everybody wants to be loved by God and give, God gave his son to prove his love. And that, but it goes on and it says that God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world might have life through him. See, we, everybody wants to be accepted. They want relationship and they want friendship. They, they're built that way. They need that. And we're looking for that. So one of the things that is a hunger for us, when we hunger for bread, Jesus, the bread of life, he gives us this relationship, this friendship. What a friend in Jesus, this acceptance. The second thing is forgiveness. You know, or you could say mercy or unconditional love, to say I still love you, unconditional love. Everybody wants someone that would love them if they knew everything you ever did wrong. Do you know they love you anyway? That's who God is. You hear that? And that is why Jesus is the bread of life. He satisfies. Only that relationship, he's the only one that you can be a certain. He gave his own son that he accepts you and that he will forgive you, that his forgiveness is totally complete and his mercy is not judging you as you deserve to be judged. And he's saying, but I still love you. And the prodigal son that comes one step toward him, God comes running at him because as the bread of life, he satisfies and satisfies this, this hunger, this desire for forgiveness. And so the, 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 the birth of Jesus was deliberate. Remember, the angel told, told Joseph, Call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He came to, to be born that he might die. He came to seek and save the lost. Philippians 2, starting in verse 6, says that, that Jesus it was in the very nature of God. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the death, even death on the cross. He came to die. He humbled himself to become like us so he could die for us, so that his blood could cover our sins. See, Jesus came to earth as a baby becoming like us, a human being that could sin. The Bible records that he was tempted in all ways as we are and yet without sin, that he overcame sin in the flesh as a man. Now, granted, he wasn't born a fallen nature, sin nature. He was second Adam. Understand that. That's, that's a little different. If you don't understand that, I'm not going to take longer to explain it. But let me just say that you, you, you have a desire, and everybody in the world, and when you share Christ with them, they're looking for true relationship and acceptance and friendship. That's why if you want to win people to Jesus, love them where they are. Be a true friend. Accept them. Reach out to them. They're looking for forgiveness, and we have it to offer through Jesus. This I still love you, unconditional love, mercy, forgiveness. And the third thing they're looking for is to not be afraid of death. You could say peace, or you could call it hope, the blessed hope, the sure hope, to know for sure Death is real. You're going to die and I'm going to die. And some of you are going to die quicker than you think you're going to die. And others of you are going to live longer than you think you'd ever live. Like George Ince, he says, I don't even know why I'm still around. How can I live this long? <laughs> she just laughs. It's because you're so wonderful. We need you, George Ince. So, but unless, unless Jesus comes again beforehand, we're all going to die. As the point of the man wants to die, then the judgment. We don't have a choice in the matter. And a lot of people are afraid of death. But the birth of Jesus speaks of his death because Jesus was born to die. You see, he was born to die, to save us. Someone once con contrasted the, the manger scene, the birth of Christ, with the death of Christ. And they said this, there was no room for them in the inn so they laid him in a manger. Uh, there was no, there was, and, and Jesus was on the cross and, no, I'm sorry. Now there was no room for him in the hearts of men, so they hung him on a cross. No room for him in the inn, so they laid him in a manger, and no room in the hearts of men, so they hung him on a cross. His birth is death. A bright star came and stood over the place where Jesus was born, 
And Jesus was on the cross and darkness fell over the whole land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. Joseph and Mary wrapped Jesus in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger where no baby had ever been laid before. Now Joseph of Arimathea, being a good and righteous man, asked Pilate for the body of Jesus and wrapped him in linen cloth and laid him in a tomb where, wherein no man had ever been laid before. And all the shepherds came and adored him and went back praising and glorifying God. And when all the people who had gathered to witness the sight, they saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. One of the wise men brought myrrh as a gift for baby Jesus. They brought myrrh. And Nicodemus brought myrrh as an ointment for the body of Jesus. The last thing the angel said to the shepherds on the hillside was peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And the last thing Christ said on the cross, or said to his disciples rather in the upper room was, peace unto you as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Peace I leave with you. You see, almost everything about the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem spoke of his ultimate destination, the cross, because that's why he came. He came to die, but then rise again from the dead. <clears throat> Hebrews 2, 14, 15, and you can mark it if you're taking notes, is a great, a great verse to read over and over at Christmas. It says this, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held slavery by their fear of death. He shared in our humanity, took up a form of a servant, became a human, that he might destroy the fear of death and free us from the slavery of the fear. See, everybody, everybody needs, can, is desiring and can be satisfied with that peace, with that lack of fear, that hope that Jesus offers. And so that's the Jesus of Bethlehem. He came to die so he could defeat death and free us from our fear of death. And I want us to sing a cappella, the last verse of O Little Town of Bethlehem, before we pray tonight. It says this, how silently, how silently, sing it, the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Will you bow your head with me? Tonight, if you're here, and that Christmas song, the words of that, where meek souls still receiving the dear Christ enters in, would you be willing to say forever yes to Jesus and receive from him the relationship, the acceptance, the friendship that you are looking for. Receive the unconditional love, the mercy, the forgiveness, the I still love you. And receive uh, uh, the freedom from the fear of death and the hope and the peace that we know that when we lay our head down on this earth that we'll wake in heaven and live forever with God. And we can have our family there too. Everybody, would you close your eyes? And if you're here and you'd like to risk saying, Jesus, if you're real, I invite you to come into my heart. Change it and do something supernatural in me and reveal yourself to me that I might be a follower of you. Anybody here say, I'd like to say that prayer right now. Anybody? Yes. I was your age when I said that prayer similar. Jesus, come into my heart. Come in today. Come in to stay. Lord Jesus, help us believe that this isn't just a story we tell children where we put up lights and give gifts, but this is the true thing that happened. God, you look down in the darkness after hundreds of years of silence. You saw the sin and the depravity and the hopelessness and the darkness. You saw the, the perversion of religion and what they're doing to your name. 
And I pray, oh God, that uh, you would, you would uh, um, help us realize that what you did when you brought the light, when you came to be born in Bethlehem, is significant because you are the bread of life that satisfies. And may we desire it more than, than the best hot bread and butter we could ever find anywhere. May we be satisfied in ways that we could never find satisfaction anywhere else in you, Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us, we pray. And everybody said, amen.